The Raspberry Pi 5 is fast, over 2.5 times faster than the Pi 4. It's the size of a credit card, and it starts at 60 bucks for a 4 gig version, 8 gigs is 80, and it should start shipping in October. I'm going to cover everything. A massive graphics card plugged into its new PCI Express port? <laughs> of course. 10 gig networking? Yep. We'll talk custom Pi Silicon, quad USB controllers, performance, everything. The competition has been way ahead of the Pi 4. During the great Raspberry Pi shortage, Rockchip released a chip that's three times faster. The Pi 5 doesn't need to hold the performance crown to win, but it does need to close the gap. Does it? And can Raspberry Pi rejuvenate its image after all the shortages? We'll see. Let's dive into what's new. Right on top is this new RP1 chip, designed by Raspberry Pi. It's a Southbridge, a go-between from the SoC over to the rest of the board. It has two built-in USB 3 controllers for full 5 gigabit bandwidth to each of these blue ports, then it has two USB 2 controllers, one for each of these black ports, gigabit ethernet, and control over all the GPIO pins. Networking hardware is nearly identical to the Pi 4, but I got double the Wi-Fi speed, and the RP1 adds wired ethernet features like PTP support. Wake on LAN is actually possible too, but more on that later. But there are other big changes. Obviously, there's the new BCM2712 SoC, but we'll get to that later. Down here, there's this brand new PMIC, or power management chip. It has a built-in real-time clock, so your Pi can keep time just like a real computer. It measures power consumption, and it lets you use USB-C power delivery to get even more power for hungry USB accessories and the faster CPU. There's a new battery connector here for the clock, and a new separate UART header. Using Raspberry Pi's debug probe, you can jack straight into the SoC now for serial console access. In the past, you had to set a special flag and plug into some GPIO pins, which was kind of annoying. But now we get to my favorite thing, this little FPC connector. See what it's labeled? That's right, full PCI Express right on the Raspberry Pi. This is a long time coming. It's still not perfect, but for me, I love it. Some other SPC makers cram an entire M.2 slot somewhere, like this one on the Orange Pi 5, but Raspberry Pi decided to use a custom FPC header. FPC stands for Flexible Printed Circuit, like this tiny flat cable, and you can use it for high-speed expansion hats now. I'll get back to PCI Express later in this video, because we got a lot to cover still. Like, what happened to the display connector that used to go here? Well, it moved down here and turned into a dual-purpose cam disc plug. The new RP1 chip allows either port to be used with a camera or display. You could have two cameras, two displays, or one of each if you want. One tiny feature that I love is this memory resistor. It's not even functional, but instead of having to look up part numbers or boot up the Pi just to see how much RAM it has, there's a resistor soldered down for 1, 2, 4, or 8 gigabytes. And I have it on good authority that the Pi 5 could handle 16 gigs someday. Then there are a few quality of life upgrades, like that RTC that keeps time, and even a real power button, fancy that. It's right next to a new dual purpose status LED, and the location isn't random. The new Pi 5 case has a combined power and LED status button, so finally you won't have to hack the case if you want a real power button. And wait, what's that? The case has better airflow too? Yeah, we'll get to that later. And they're also making an active cooler that plugs into the 4-pin fan plug over here. It snaps into these two extra little holes on the board. But do you need a heatsink or a fan? Probably, but we'll get to thermals later. Flipping over the board, there's a trusty old micro SD card slot that's been around since the Pi B Plus, except this slot is twice as fast as the one on the Pi 4, and second, well, second is actually something missing. Look closely. What don't you see? There aren't any more through-hole components. If you haven't seen my video on how they make Raspberry Pis, go check it out. In that video, there's a huge part of the assembly line where these fancy robots slowly and meticulously place a bunch of through-hole components like these GPIO headers. This new design drops through-hole components entirely, meaning everything on it is surface mount. This makes manufacturing easier since the production line doesn't need any complex robots, and it might even make the board more reliable. That's more a thing manufacturing nerds will love, but there are a bunch of other big changes, like the PoE header. It's way down here instead of right next to the GPIO pins. Yes, that means there'll have to be a new PoE hat, and no, I haven't seen it yet. Also, the USB and Ethernet ports flipped back to how they were in the Pi 3 and earlier, meaning it goes Ethernet, then USB 3, then USB 2 now. Also, the camera and display connectors use the same narrow FPC connector from the Pi Zero, meaning you'll need to use these narrow adapter cables if you already have a Pi camera. 
The AV jack is gone, and now there's just a little empty header for analog video out. That means if you want sound, you'll either have to use an HDMI monitor with built-in speakers or use Bluetooth or USB audio. The network chip is identical to the one in the Pi 4, but it's rotated to make signal routing work better. And last, but certainly not least, instead of the BCM2711, there's the new BCM2712 system on a chip, which contains the Pi's brains, the GPU and CPU that makes the Pi go. The new SoC has a quad-core ARM A76 CPU running at 2.4 GHz. Across the line, it's at least twice as fast as the Pi 4, usually faster. It also has a new Video Core 7 GPU, which can decode H.265 up to 4K and 60 frames per second, and is capable of driving two 4K displays at 60 Hz. We'll get more into performance later, but with this new chip and all these new components, another big change is new power requirements. You'll notice that I'm using a new power adapter. This board has so much new I.O. capability, it really needed a power upgrade. You can pump 25 watts into the Pi 5, and it all goes through this new power stage. The new dialog chip down here can negotiate USB-C power delivery, so you can use the Pi 5 with any compliant adapter. But to get the full potential, I still recommend Raspberry Pi's own 5 amp power supply. Many other power supplies might say they provide 5 amps, but if they don't, you might wind up with a current protection warning at boot. Raspberry Pi still supports their old 3 amp USB-C power adapter, so if you don't have a new adapter, you can still run the Pi 5 in a low power mode with your old one. But my advice, just get the official one if you don't want to worry. The new chip also exposes power monitoring for the first time on the Pi. The VC Gen command utility has a new power monitor function, and you can read back all the voltages with the command PMIC read ADC. But to control that power, there's a power button. It's a long time coming, and other competitors' boards have had power buttons for a while now. But it's nice to see it here. You press it once to boot the Pi, and then press it again to safely shut down. And the eagle-eyed might see there's a wide LED lens on the new Pi 5 case that's actually the button actuator, meaning you can press on it to turn the Pi on or shut it down. We'll get back to the rest of the case later. First, I want to talk about sleep. I mean, new power button, new CPU, surely Raspberry Pi is thinking about supporting sleep modes for power savings. Well, yes, but right now the firmware doesn't support it. Supposedly, sleep and wake on land should be possible, but so far I haven't been able to test them. Hopefully those features will come soon, maybe even by the time the Pi 5 is shipping. As a consolation prize, this thing boots up in 7 seconds. With the RTC and the RP1 chip, there are a few ways we can hack around sleep until that's supported. But now we get to performance. I mentioned earlier the Pi 5 is at least twice as fast as the Pi 4 at, well, pretty much everything. CPUs 2 to 3 times faster, memories 2 to 4 times faster, Wi-Fi and microSD are twice as fast, and all this while being 50% more power efficient. How does it do it? Well, besides upgrading to LPDDR4X RAM, a lot comes down to the new BCM2712 system on a chip. This chip is built by Broadcom with four ARM A76 cores running at 2.4 GHz, and it's manufactured on a 16 nanometer process. It's interesting to compare this thing to Rockchip's RK3588, an 8 nanometer chip. That chip also uses a big dot little architecture with four high power A76 cores and four efficiency A55 cores, and devices that use it tend to cost a little bit more than the Pi. But to save on cost, Raspberry Pi just went with four high power cores on a slightly older process node. We'll see if that decision's a good one. And I know fitting everything on the same credit card size board created its own constraints. The latest Rock chip boards are a bit larger than the Pi, though the Rock 5A bucks that trend. The BCM2712 was specifically designed for the tiny Pi 5 with all the pins on this chip placed specifically for this layout. Compared to the Pi 4, from media encoding to running PHP to compiling the Linux kernel, this thing is 2 to 2.5 times faster. And for cryptography, the Pi is 45 times faster. The A76 cores finally bring ARM's crypto extensions to the Pi ecosystem. RAM is way faster too. Pi 5 has LPDDR4X, which runs at 4267 MHz, while using less power than the old memory in the Pi 4. How does that translate to performance? Well, the Pi 5 obliterates the Pi 4 in every way here, from 2 to 4 times speedups for anything that touches RAM, and latency is also cut in more than half. But what about the RK3588? Well, I tested the Pi 5 against the Orange Pi 5 and Rock 5 Model B, and here, while the price is still in Raspberry Pi's favor, you really get what you pay for. If you're willing to stretch your budget beyond 100 bucks, you can get even more performance. 
They all have the same LPDDR4X and 4A76 cores, but the Rockchip's more efficient process node and four extra cores push the limits. Rockchip really nailed this chip, and the Pi 5 lags a little, but it does stay in the ring, especially for value. It's neck and neck for media encoding and actually faster for some things like PHP, so it really depends on how you use it, which one's actually the fastest. I'm just excited because we're really spoiled for choice. The Pi 5 isn't the SBC performance king, but it keeps Pi in the race this generation, especially if they can keep it on the shelves at just 60 bucks. But what good's all that power if thermals are terrible? For all these boards, some form of cooling is now a basic requirement. You can run the Pi 5 bare just like you could a Pi 4, but unless you're just doing light browsing or typing a document, it'll throttle. Now, even throttled, the Pi 5's a lot faster than a Pi 4, but for almost everyone, I recommend some form of cooling. And there are two first party options. This new active cooler is gonna be five bucks or the new case will be 10. I tested both along with just this tiny heatsink and here are the numbers. With no fan and no heatsink, throttling starts in less than 30 seconds. Now, if I add a little heatsink in, it keeps the pie from throttling for a full five minutes. So just a tiny heatsink will get you through a lot, but especially in a case, you need a fan. With the active cooler, the pie never broke 60 degrees and there's no chance it'd throttle. The case with just the fan and no heatsink lets the pie run a bit hotter, but it, it never passed 75. Add on a heatsink and it should pop down to probably around 70. And how about noise? The squirrel cage fan on the active cooler is nearly silent and only ramped up while I was running benchmarks. Even then, it maxed out around 40 decibels and didn't have any buzzy noise. It, it, it never even ramped up to 100% except when I was overclocking. The case fan is audible and it's a huge improvement over the Pi 4 retrofit case fan, but it's a step below the fan on the active cooler. But the noise is also better because the new case was actually designed better. There's actually ventilation. The, the fan is a little bigger and it uses PWM to keep the fan nearly silent most of the time. And that top cover can even be removed so you can stack cases if you want. And for overclocking, you gotta run a fan. On my alpha unit, I could run stable at up to 2.6 gigahertz, but some benchmarks got a little flaky at 2.8. So it's faster, the fans are quieter, but I haven't touched on efficiency. Bottom line, the Pi 5 is a lot more efficient than the Pi 4 all out. And idle power isn't bad either, at least with the official power supply. The Pi 5 sucks down 1.8 watts, which is within spitting distance of the Pi 4. Under load, it's 50% more efficient. Shutdown power is a little weird now though. The, the Pi 5 has the same issue as the Pi 4, where when you shut it down completely, it'll still be pulling a watt or so. If you edit the boot config like this though, it'll power down to less than a tenth of a watt. And like I mentioned earlier, sleep might finally be possible, though it's not in the alpha firmware, so I'm not gonna cover it here. But Rockchip really holds the efficiency crown for now. There's really no contest at all. Raspberry Pi traded efficiency for cost. The Pi 5's 16 nanometer chip keeps it a bit cheaper than the competition, but with the trade-off that it's a little less efficient. Now, hiding right next to the CPU on this chip is the new Video Core 7 GPU, and it has some upgrades too. It can handle a full 60 hertz on 4K displays, and not just like the it barely works level of the Pi 4. It can play H.265 video at 4K60, it runs Super Tuxcart at 30 FPS on high, and it runs Open Arena at an okay-ish frame rate on high settings too. YouTube playback is close to perfect at 60 frames per second, though I couldn't test 4K playback. YouTube seems to be blocking that option on PyOS for some reason. I tried the next best thing and played two HD videos next to each other on a 4K display, and they were watchable, but not quite smooth. I mean, it's not gonna beat a Mac or anything like that, but it's certainly more useful than the Pi 4 if you want a tiny desktop. The GL Mark II score was 117 full screen or 905 windowed, and I also got Vulkan running after I installed the Mesa Vulkan drivers. Chromium's GPU support is working in Debian 12, and I also installed Super Mario 64 and had a smooth 60 FPS there. I tried installing Steam with Pi apps, but after a reboot, I couldn't get back into the desktop environment, so probably just something that needs to be updated for the new OS. I'm sure other channels will dive deep into retro gaming and Box64 on this thing, and I am excited to see what kind of results they get. But I decided to move on to seeing if I can get one of these things working on the Pi. I mean, go big or go home, right? Well, good news and bad news. This little PCI Express header uses a custom FPC connection, and right now there aren't any hats or external breakouts to plug in PCIe devices. I have this prototype board I had to borrow from Raspberry Pi, but it's more for debugging. Also, out of the box, this thing's only rated for one lane of PCI Express Gen 2 speed, meaning you can still only get five giga transfers per second through it. In good news, the bus can technically pump through Gen 3 speeds, though it's not certified for that speed. 
All you have to do to hack that is to add these lines in your boot config and restart. So I did that, and I tested everything. Graphics cards like the latest NVIDIA and AMD GPUs don't just lock up the whole system anymore, so some of those bugs I ran into on the compute module are fixed. And older GPUs may work better, but there are still driver issues on ARM, especially on AMD's side. NVIDIA's driver installed, and I could see the graphics card, but I still run into this RM init adapter error. We'll, we'll get there though, I'm sure of it. And yes, I recompile the kernel like 20 times. There's a shirt for that on redshirtjeff.com. For the best ARM experience with GPUs though, you should see this AdLink desktop. My big upgrade video is coming soon, so make sure you're subscribed. Switching tracks to NVMe SSDs, I got 450 megabytes per second with Gen 2, or 900 megabytes per second at Gen 3. I've actually been booting off this Kyoxia drive at Gen 3 for all my testing, and it's been perfectly stable. And what about RAID? I tested a hardware RAID card and an HBA, and both seemed to get recognized without even patching the kernel like I had to do on the Pi 4. But I had a little trouble with the CLI utility, so I can't access a hard drive on it just yet. I also tried a Coral TPU over PCIe, and it seemed to work, but when I tried running image recognition on it, the thing flaked out a bit. It's certainly promising, and there might be a way to get it working on the Pi 5, but it'll take a little more time in testing. Something that worked perfectly was this ASUS 10 gig NIC. Because it's limited to one PCIe lane though, it can only really put through about 6 gigabits of traffic. So the Pi 5 might be great for 2.5 or 5 gig networking, but it's not ready for a full 10 gig network, at least not yet. And something missing on this connector is any USB pins, so if you want something like a 5G hat, you're still going to need to get USB up to it, like on this board. I heard Raspberry Pi is working on a better cable than the little one I'm using, and I'm sure third parties are going to come out with a ton of useful new hardware now that we have full PCI Express. Before I wrap up PCIe, I should note the connector only delivers about 5 watts max over the 5 volt power line, so something like an NVMe hat might need a 12 volt barrel plug that powers it and the Pi. We'll see. And even if you don't want to boot off NVMe, the microSD card slot uses UHS-1 now, meaning I can get double the speed of the Pi 4. I got 90 megabytes per second on a SanDisk Extreme card versus 46 on the Pi 4. USB boot still works too, and now you can get a full 5 gigabits on both USB 3 ports plus extra power if you use a 5 amp power supply. That means you can do shenanigans like copy data between USB drives around 600 megabytes per second, or have a USB SSD and a 2.5 gig network adapter both running at full speed. And the RP1 also has two full USB 2.0 buses, so the black ports run at 480 megabits apiece. And if you don't have a 5 amp adapter, you can still use the USB ports, but you'll have to choose if you want full CPU power or more current to the USB ports. Continuing the theme of double is better, the built-in Wi-Fi uses the exact same hardware chip, but it's double the speed. From the same location in my basement, I'm getting about 200 megabits per second, where on the Pi 4, I got just over 100. And built-in Ethernet? Well, it's pretty much identical, since it's still a gigabit. I really wish they went to 2.5 gigs this generation, but at least I can still get faster Ethernet through PCIe or a USB adapter. And speaking of USB adapters, I wanted to see if this Netgear Nighthawk Wi-Fi 6E adapter would work on the Pi 5, and you know what? It did. Because it's a pretty new adapter, I had to patch the system to tell it to use MediaTek's driver, but I was able to get 6 GHz Wi-Fi 6E right out of the box on the Pi 5. Down in my office, the thing goes through like four walls, so the Wi-Fi speed wasn't much better, but if I moved everything upstairs closer to the router, I got, well, only about 260 megabits. Using a PCI Express version would probably be faster. I tested one on the Compute Module 4 last year, and I got about 1.5 gigabits. Besides all the high-speed connections, there are still 40 GPIO, or General Purpose, input-output pins. These pins carry power, ground, and SPI, I2C, and other ins and outs, so you can interface a Pi with tons of devices. The big difference this time around is these pins all go through the RP1. There are a few reasons for that, but a big one is to protect the main processor from dying if you accidentally short a couple pins. The RP1 uses the 40 nanometer process node, so it can handle more current. Inside is a close relative to the RP2040. So the next big question I have is, what fun things can we do with it? I mentioned earlier in the video this chip adds on PTP support courtesy of a Cadence gem inside. So if you have a GPS disciplined oscillator on a GPIO pin, you can use that to drive precise network time over PTP. Explain like I'm 5, RP1 makes clock tick better. I haven't had time to test PTP yet, but the driver already shows hardware support is ready. I'm excited to see what other surprises might lay hidden inside this RP1 though. 
Rounding out I.O., I tested a camera module 3 on the cam display ports. It worked without a hitch, autofocus and everything. With the ability to run two cameras, you can do stereo vision right on the Pi 4 instead of needing a compute module like the Stereo Pi required. The Pi 5 will be even more popular for machine vision and robotics, especially with the global shutter camera. The bottom line is the Pi 5 is basically the Pi 4, just two to three times faster and with a lot more I.O. The Pi 4 4 gig model sells for 55 bucks and the Pi 5 is 60 and the Pi 5 8 gig model is 80. It'd be nice to see if they release a $40 2 gig model too, but we'll see. It's certainly nice the Pi still undercuts the competition on price, though the competition has been doing quite well these days. I don't feel as uncomfortable today dipping my toes in other SBC ecosystems as I did back in 2019. Risk 5 is finally starting to eat at the low end too. One thing's for sure, the SBC ecosystem is heating up going into 2024. What else do you want to know about the Pi 5? Let me know in the comments. Until next time, I'm Jeff Kierling.